Dr. Marissa Stridham was a high achiever, full of energy, a real zest for life. Her great loves, her husband Robert, and their shared passion for climbing the world's highest mountains. But deep in the Everest death zone, 8,000 metres up, disaster struck. When Robert Grapel reached the peak of the world on May 20th, 2016, it was supposed to be the pinnacle of his climbing career, an accumulation of his life's work that had started at eight years old, but instead, he felt empty. It wasn't what he imagined, not because of the view or the accomplishment, but because he stood on the roof of the world alone. His 34-year-old wife, Dr. Maria Stridham, had not been able to reach the summit with him. As she stood just below Rob, on the south summit of Everest, completely spent and suffering from high altitude sickness, but nobody was prepared for what would happen next. This is their story. Yep, we're back to Mount Everest. A mountain that I find myself spending countless hours reading about, and this week's story is no different as we travel back to the tallest peak on our planet. In May of 2016, Robert Gruppel and his wife Maria Stridham would find themselves at the base camp of Mount Everest with the goal of finally reaching the roof of the world together, a goal they had been striving towards and manifesting for years. Rob had been climbing since he could walk. When he was eight years old, he would summit his first peak in the Cathedral Range, and he would never look back. He loved climbing, and after meeting Maria at Queensland Uni while studying vet science, the pair became inseparable. Maria would eventually graduate with a degree in finance, but quickly developed a love for the outdoors alongside Rob. After they were married and moved to Melbourne, Australia, the couple would set a goal together, climb some of the world's highest mountains, and the king of them all, Mount Everest. They were both experienced, but the tallest mountain on earth was a level up from the climbs that they were accustomed to. Both Rob and Maria's family did not oppose the challenge, but they were weary and several times questioned the pair if they were sure that this is what they wanted. Weeks before their trip to base camp, they would send their wills to their family, further increasing the stress, as it was the first realization that what they were doing was truly dangerous and Maria's mother would fly to Melbourne just to say goodbye and good luck to her daughter, as she had a feeling that she just needed to see her. Hearing Maria's mother's voice crack while listening to her recount the days before the trip was intense and made the hairs along my neck stand up. I cannot imagine the feeling, knowing your loved one is about to do something incredibly dangerous, but also that it was something that she felt like she had to do. But even as Rob and Maria's parents waved them goodbye, they still expected to see them come back through that door weeks later, just as they always had. For those of you that don't know, 2016 was the first climbing season after the infamous 7.8 magnitude earthquake that would strike Nepal and the surrounding countries in 2015. It was devastating, and even today there are still remnants of the damage throughout the surrounding areas, with some of the small communities being completely destroyed. 22 people would lose their lives on Everest during the base camp due to the quake, and thousands more would lose their life throughout the country. There is a fantastic Netflix documentary called Aftershock that describes the events of that day in great detail. Since most of the 2015 season was spent recovering from the earthquake, nobody would summit the mountain that year, and many companies and climbers were anxious to get back in 2016. When Rob and Maria walked into base camp after the usual week-long hike, well, it was nice and crowded with rows of tents prepping for the busy season. Rob and Maria were there with three Sherpas, and they would begin the acclimatization process almost immediately as they would be climbing the South Call route. Acclimating to the environment is crucial on Everest and is done by gradually making your way up the mountain to one of the various camps, spending some time, typically a day or night at the higher altitude, then climbing back down to base camp to rest, refuel, and repeat. You would continue this process until you are acclimated as best as possible to the environment, and the right opportunity presents itself to make the final summit push. Rob and Maria would spend six weeks climbing to the various camps on the mountain, then descending. It would be mid-May by the time that they finally felt ready, and unlike most stories told on this channel, the weather was perfect for climbing. 
They would make their way up the mountain the first few days, traveling quickly and honestly having no issues reaching Camp 3 at 7,162 meters. But it was here, just under the death zone, that we all know that the real danger begins. The oxygen in the air is a fraction of what it is at sea level, and your body literally begins to die, one cell at a time. The danger is in the name, and spending any large quantity of time at that altitude, well it typically does not end well. Rob and Maria of course knew that they were on a time limit, and that is why they prepared to leave Camp 3 at nearly midnight so they could reach Camp 4 in the early morning. This is where they would enter the death zone, but they would rest before making the final push less than 24 hours from their current time. But everything is slow, and it would take them along with their three Sherpas nearly two hours to get ready. If the altitude and exhaustion doesn't kill you, one simple mistake certainly can, as the only light illuminates from each climber's headlamps reflecting off the snow and rock. It was below negative 30 degrees, and the terrain is brutal, but nobody said it would be easy. Rob and Maria's family would watch the pair's progress through a satellite tracker, praying for them both, as that was all the support that they could lend. It was a little after 11 a.m. when Rob and Maria would stumble into Camp 4, just above 8,000 meters. They were behind schedule, and the clock was ticking, but they still had time to rest before making their final push. At 7 p.m. that night, Maria and Rob would finally begin the last push with their three Sherpa companions. The conditions couldn't have been more perfect, as there had been nothing but clear skies, and the plan was to reach the summit and return back to Camp 4 in roughly 12 hours. But similar to the climb from Camp 3 to Camp 4, the group was just moving too slow. Maria was struggling, as they made their way up to the summit, and after reaching the south summit, her body was slowly giving out. This video of Maria just shows how close the summit was from the group, but the final push from the south summit to the top is technical, and the terrain becomes incredibly difficult. It had been 14 hours in the death zone at this point, and Maria and Rob were both suffering from high altitude sickness, and they were low on oxygen, but Rob at summit fever. This is when the idea of reaching the top becomes so tantalizing that he would throw safety out the window, and half lethargic, he would ask Maria if he could continue while she stayed at the south summit with one of the Sherpas. Of course Maria, not wanting to hold back her husband who had dreamt of this moment his entire life, immediately said yes, and it was decided that Rob would continue the climb, eager to finish the final stretch. While Rob continued to climb at 9 a.m., Maria and her Sherpa would turn around and begin the descent back to Camp 4. A few hours later, Rob would stand on the roof of the world, but something was off. Rob realized as he stood on top of the mountain that without Maria, it just wasn't the same. Yes, he had dreamed about this moment since he was a kid, but after meeting his wife, well, his life changed and he wanted to spend those special moments with her. He didn't spend long on the summit, he took one picture and quickly started the descent. But Rob was hallucinating at this point. It is difficult to describe his condition, but it is known that he was hardly able to walk. In fact, he would spend stretches of the route simply sliding, resting, and then trying to walk again. But even at this pace, he was able to eventually make it back to the south summit, where he had originally left Maria. While his wife was on her own descent, both of their recounts of the conditions were very similar. Both groups would slowly take a few steps, fall to the ground, and slide a few more inches before resting. Then they would gather the strength to repeat the process, each time progressing roughly 10 meters. Maria continued pushing for as long as she could, until she just couldn't stand anymore and would have to be carried back to Camp 4. At 2 a.m., nearly 31 hours in the death zone, she would finally make it into a tent with six other climbers. But she was lethargic, unable to listen to anyone, simply demanding to see her husband. Meanwhile, Rob was still descending the mountain, and at one point he would fall asleep on the route. I don't think I need to explain how bad this is, but luckily, another team was pushing for the summit, and they would wake Rob up check his oxygen, which to no surprise was empty. They urged him to continue down the mountain as stopping the death zone. Well, you already know. When Rob finally stumbled back into Camp 4, he was falling asleep as he walked, but a friend of him urged to talk to Maria as they were worried about her. Her condition had improved during the night as she was on oxygen and had eaten a little bit, but it was still dangerously negative as they tried to keep her awake. The team was communicating with base camp who was urging the other climbers to keep Maria awake due to the risk of her never waking up again should she fall asleep. 
They were also trying to coordinate a rescue effort, but in the death zone, there was no way for a rescue team to reach them. So base camp urged the climbers to reach camp three if they were to have any chance to save Maria. At 8 a.m. the sun had risen, and Maria had gone through phases of being completely coherent and the next minute hallucinating. But she was able to walk on her own. They had no other choice but to start the descent down the mountain. Their progress was slow as both Rob and Maria were barely able to walk, but they did inch their way down the mountain and eventually out of the death zone, the first positive sign for a rescue. But it was shortly after they finally descended below 8,000 meters that tragedy would strike. One step at a time, Maria was walking until the next step did not come. Maria would slip and entangle herself around the guideline, falling off the route down the mountain a few feet. Rob would cry out and muster the strength to reach her. He would wrap his arms around her, but it was too late. Maria was exhausted and she would pass away in her husband's arms. Rob and the rest of the team would eventually make it off Everest with no incident, but Maria would remain on the mountain for a few more weeks, where she would eventually be taken down and laid to rest by her family. Although Rob would survive the ordeal, he would suffer from a severe case of frostbite, but most of all, he was emotionally damaged. And to this day, he struggles to recount those last few days on the mountain. Listening to him tell some of his story left a lasting impression on me, as it was obvious just how deeply this man cared for his wife and the immense guilt that he felt. But I believe most of all, the words that Maria would speak countless times always rung in my ears when researching this story. To fail is one thing, to quit is another, and I am no quitter. What would you like um, people to know about Marissa? <laughs> Just got to look at the pictures of her. I can't, I still can't look at any pictures of her because Thank you.